go ahead, Laura, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'll wait just a moment or two more. It's 10 exactly right now. So let's give it maybe one or two more minutes and then we can sure. go ahead and get started. Hey, this is our fifth week of running these hub meetings and uh, we set aside two hours, but it, they've been taking about an hour and a half um, and we're happy to stay on at the end and continue sharing. So I wanted to give a big shout out to my um, internal team as well for continuing to support this work, Nicole with them, Abba Kaiser and Tia Taylor. So um, we've been working hard to continue to update the hub with resources that are coming through. And, um, and I wanted to also just give a shout out to Laura Lee Misterly from Quill Saskett Farms, a photo from her farm from a couple years ago. We would have been out there in June for our REEU internship program, which um, had to be canceled this year. But um, I just wanted to reminisce a little bit about what a magical place that is and um, how much we love being able to spend time out in Stevens County. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, a quick overview of today's meeting. And again, these are very flexible topics. If we find that there's something else more pressing that we want to talk about, uh, we can definitely shift gears. We'll give, again, a quick overview of the hub itself, talk a little bit about the needs assessment tool. Um, we're gonna, we have a guest today, uh, Faith Kreitzer from WSU, and they started uh, through the Food Sciences Program, a WSU Farm and Food Processing Q&A resource that she's gonna highlight today. I wanted to talk a little bit about how to find farms to purchase from, as well as a, a statewide project that's happening right now to create a Washington food atlas. And then also just talk a little bit about county and conservation district efforts. And then just time to share at the end. So I, I wanna again, welcome all of you. Uh, please introduce yourself in the Zoom chat box. You can let us know who you are, where you're located and what you do and also share resources in the chat box. This is, we um, download the chat box after the call and we use all those links uh, that you've provided to update our hub. And it's also a really great way for matchmaking uh, when you see people either post a resource that you're looking for, or you can ask questions for resources in there. Uh, it's a great way to do some networking during the call. So a little bit about our um, food systems program. So we uh, have a team of uh, food systems team through WSU as well as external partners. We have about 100 people on the team. Um, we're focused on academic research and extension activities uh, with specialized resources for farmers and food systems contributors. And we seek to work with communities throughout the state to foster viable farm businesses, optimize sustainable natural resource stewardship, and to promote scaled processing and distribution, always in the pursuit of access to healthy food for all. Uh, the team itself collaborates on initiatives that again promote research, implement change, and provide unparalleled educational opportunities for food and farm system stakeholders throughout the state. And this just kind of shows the reach of WSU as the land grant institution for Washington. We have offices in all 39 counties um, on the Colville tribe. We have multiple campuses and uh, we mentioned this before, but many of these campuses also, um, as well as extension offices have access to Wi-Fi right now during COVID. So if you are feeling particularly marginalized with where you are and access to broadband to be able to do work participate in webinars, um, get your online platform up and running. If you're a producer, please, please reach out to your local county office to see if they provide Wi-Fi. We also know that many libraries are also providing Wi-Fi as well as utility districts um, and utility providers. So again, just wanting to remind you to reach out and use those resources. Uh, you're more than welcome to contact Nicole and I as well if you need um, additional support. So the WSU Food Systems COVID-19 Hub, the purpose of the hub is to provide a space to connect regularly with both WSU and external partners uh, to collect and update COVID-19 resources to support the Washington food system. We have a dynamic, dynamic needs assessment tool that is deployed weekly on a continuous basis to track uh, needs across the state and also look at how needs are changing over time to help support a more resilient food system moving forward and just to provide time and space to share stories and receive support from one another. 
So we have a calendar of events up on our website. Um, it's populated with tons of different information. And we just wanted to mention an event that's happening right now as well. It was scheduled to happen at 10 o'clock this morning. It's with uh, uh, Director Derek Sanderson and Nicole can share a little bit more about that. We're hoping it will be recorded and we can place that on our website. So this is uh, Congresswoman Susan Delbaney and uh, was, is having a live discussion right now with Director Sanderson. We almost thought about just live streaming this during our call today, uh, but we weren't sure how long it was gonna last as well as sort of the level of discussion, whether it would be something that would be approachable for us on the call, but uh, we wanted to make you aware of it. If you have the opportunity, maybe you can live stream both this call as well as that. Um, so uh, we do have, um, we will try to uh, put a link to that after the call. Today. Go back to share my screen. Um, and then the needs assessment tool. So we are really trying to come up with a better rhythm of this. So we're sending it out on Wednesdays. We're hoping that all of you can fill it out by Friday. Uh, we're also asking you to send it out to your network. So right now it's being sent out to the food systems team, to all of the WSU County directors, to um, all of the extension faculty across our three program units. Um, but it's really designed to be taken uh, by anyone in the Washington food system. And I just had uh, the WSDA reach out to me last week and ask if we would add an additional question on here about accessing PPE supplies um, for farms and farmers markets. So they're really hoping to use this as a tool to see whether or not that's a high need and how they can um, help with some resource allocation. And I wanted to just open up a little bit of discussion about that right now to see for those of you who are supporting uh, farmers markets or farm stands, direct to consumer opportunities, whether or not there's been a challenge in accessing PPE supplies. I know farmers in Jefferson County, I've seen a couple posts come out on social media looking for hand sanitizer. I know several of the distilleries have shifted focus in terms of um, their production to also produce hand sanitizer and WSU is also producing an FDA approved hand sanitizer. Uh, so I thought we could just a little bit of discussion about this right now before we launch into um, the overview of the work that the, um, the food sciences program is doing. Sounds like everyone's, I guess, it, we, we, no one on the call has information to share, but it would be nice to know um, as this tool gets deployed weekly that you're sending it out to uh, farmers market managers and farmers in your area, especially those that are doing direct to consumer sales uh, to see whether or not that's a high need for them is being able to acquire things like mask, masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer. Okay, so I'm really happy to welcome Faith Kreitzer and there's a couple other people on the call today as well um, who are associated with the WSU Farm and Food Processing Q&A resource. So I'm gonna turn it over to Faith and I don't know if you have right, slides to share, me. Faith, but I'm happy to stop sharing my screen if there's anything that you wanted to share. Yeah, as well. I'll probably, I'll share the PDF um, that we'll be sending out as a... Uh, I'll make sure that Nicole gives you sharing. Let's see if it lets me. Yeah. I, th I think Hi. it is. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for having me today. I really appreciate you all uh, giving us some time to just share uh, another resource that has kind of come out uh, from all of this. So I'll kind of move this over a little bit. Um, so in essence, this kind of came about naturally, I would say just kind of organically from um, myself serving as the uh, produce safety statewide uh, extension specialist um, and really getting questions coming in. And then also with some of uh, my A&R colleagues, I know Gwen Hoheisel is on the call um, and uh, Karen Lewis was another member of the tree fruit team that we work closely with as well as a few others. 
that we were finding ourselves answering very similar questions. Um, you know, definitely many of them I would be able to answer within my wheelhouse, a few outside of my uh, comfort area, but it kind of led us to say, well, if we're answering similar questions, it would be nice then if we kind of develop a, a Q&A resource for people um, so that we can basically, you know, there's so much information coming at them. They don't have time necessarily to digest it all. And if they have a question, it will help to basically answer that question and identify, you know, what resources we've used to pull in to help answer that uh, question query. Um, but just trying to get, you know, kind of an aggregate so that people can see um, exactly what we have available. This is just one slide um, that I developed last night, trying to make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, when we first started, um, which we just kicked it off this week, um, I, we were just telling people to email me and that's still definitely an option. Uh, but if people would just prefer to submit directly, this is a Qualtrics survey link. Um, Nicole had mentioned that that may be a little bit more user friendly. Um, and, you know, especially if it grows, <laughs> uh, for my inbox especially, <laughs> but uh, essentially within this, they can submit questions either directly to me by email or by using uh, the Qualtrics survey. And so that's what's linked both in the QR code as well as uh, the link there. So that will send them to me. I'll be checking those daily. Um, essentially, the resources then get uh, divided, uh, the questions get divided out into subject matter uh, areas, and then we assign them to a subject matter expert. Our goal is to try and to develop a question, an answer within five working days. Um, this is going to be, you know, driven by, you know, everybody's doing this in addition to the work they're already doing, right? So I think that um, if we have a, a lot of response, we may uh, need to see uh, kind of shifting that expectation, but that's our goal currently. Um, the, let me see, I'm not sharing my desktop, but let me stop sharing. Um, I can share the website as well if you want to well, show some of the I, I'm going to share my up. desktop and see how that works. Y'all tell me if it looks really funky on your end and um, we'll see if this goes okay sometimes. There we go. Share that. Um, and if you can see all the files open on my desktop, don't judge me. Uh, so <laughs> here is um, the resource again, if people wanted to uh, go and submit, looks like my internet's working uh, over time today. Uh, if they wanted to go in and submit a question directly to us, and of course email is also definitely fine if they prefer to have kind of a more one-on-one -on -one, uh, with someone. Um, the resource, the, the website we've actually uh, have been working on getting up and running. I am by no means a WordPress whiz, but we have a, in a uh, basically an accordion set. So right now, uh, so these were the questions basically that I could field. We have a few uh, more sets out for basically answering from our subject matter experts, but once we develop them, we basically just, um, oh, um, we can just basically upload them here. You will see some repetitiveness. Again, knowing that not everybody's going to read every the, the document in whole, they're probably just looking for the one thing that they're interested in. And then they can link out to kind of the resources that we utilize to help develop these answers. Uh, you'll notice it's really important for us uh, and something we heard is a, a definite need from our um, clients was that we needed to translate this into Spanish. So again, our, our ANR colleagues and also my, I've been listed one of my graduate students is helping with this effort uh, so that we can again provide translation. And, and that comes, you know, a couple of days after typically uh, we've answered the question in English, it's posted again uh, on the website. The other things we can look at here um, are um, a few resources that we've highlighted. Again, we're um, trying to basically take some of these tools that a lot of people have referenced, but in honesty are pretty complex when you get into actually using them. So a lot of people have heard a reference to using this EPA list in to pick a disinfectant uh, for use against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so like how, how do I actually use that? It's not as simple. And if anybody's ever looked at like a, a label for 
an antimicrobial pesticide product, uh, what we call a sanitizer a lot of times, they're not easy to read. So in this tutorial, it's just me uh, kind of going through and walking through how do you look at like what sanitizers you have on hand, uh, how do you check their labels and see if they are on the EPA list in? And if they're not, what can you do uh, to, to check and see maybe if there's efficacy, uh, even though that product hasn't been officially listed according to the EPA? Um, we're also developing infographics. And um, again, we're going to be sharing these on our website uh, through our COVID-19 resources I'll take you to at the very end. Um, but in essence, just know that we're trying to develop material as quickly as we can to help kind of support some of the uh, kind of core areas that we're seeing questions around and that I, and that we feel as if we can uh, develop uh, good content for and help share with our clients. Um, I would, you know, just end in by saying that, you know, please um, feel free to connect. I have uh, kind of, I'm a Luddite. Uh, but I have begrudgingly adopted a Twitter handle for our program to just to help share this information more widely. Um, I was using our Consumer Food Safety Facebook page, but now I've developed one again for our uh, independent for this program because the messaging is a bit different for different uh, sectors, right? So I uh, did that. And then, of course, our website um, is always a, a resource for people. And, you know, once we move past this, where we try and house all of our Get agricultural practices information and things along those lines. So uh, other COVID related uh, resources are just on our resource list. And again, the, the resources listed here are very similar to things that you're going to find on the hub. The only thing that may be a little bit more specific are things under our program. And we do have the, the food hub, uh, the uh, COVID-19 hub from the food systems listed here. So again, just trying to cross pollinate uh, resources for people. If to help them use their time as best we can. Um, that is really all I had. I didn't want to take a, a ton of time from you guys today, but um, wanted to really uh, kind of share this tool and, and really say thank you to everyone who's helped make it happen. Like I said, this is not just me. It's a, it's a big group of people pitching in and really helping out there. Hey, thank you so much. I know there's a couple other people on the call today that are part of this um, effort. And mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else wants to kind of share what they're hearing or um, sort of some of the uh, specific um, concerns they're getting from farm and food processors. It would be great. And then also anyone else who's on the call that just might have a, a question about this resource or um, some feedback. It would be great to hear from you as well. This is Gwen. I don't have anything to add because Faith does a great job. It's just, you don't have to ask. I mean, the, the goal of this is, is that the, a lot of the farms that I work with, and I'm working in um, a lot of commercial ag, <clears throat> they are nervous to ask or don't want to ask. And so the goal is to really protect, protect people's confidentiality because we know people need, like a general regulation comes out, but how to navigate that is such a hard thing to do. So you can ask pretty much anybody an extension and they could get that information in a confidential way to faith. And so, I mean, if you have the question, I'm sure everybody else does. I've, I've been asked very strange questions that I'm like, I don't even know what that is, but I, I'll go find an answer. I have, you know, so there's a lot of things I don't know, but I'm glad that we have a big team. And Faith kind of undersold herself that she's branched out with a lot of other people in different universities to also try and answer these questions if it's not in her wheelhouse. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we definitely like a uh, worker safety is not our thing, right? So we, we reached out and Gwen actually connected us uh, to, you know, P. Nash and at the University of Washington and having them help field some of those questions that by no means are anything I've ever thought about. Um, not that they're not important, uh, but I just didn't feel confident, you know, getting, reading resources and, and developing an answer. So we're really trying to go to people who have that expertise. And with that in mind, we're going to get a lot of local food systems questions. So again, Nicole and I have had a conversation a couple of days ago uh, about like utilizing some of you all as subject matter experts where you feel comfortable and confident uh, just to kind of spread the wealth and, and you know, kind of 
let our people shine where they have resources and, and are really well connected. Um, and as Gwen mentioned, um, we're all in for tailoring this to the right approach for the right group. Uh, we heard that, you know, like in our region, I'm, I'm based in Richland, Washington. So in our region, it was really important to, you know, people were nervous about coming forward, right? Um, and so we put a message out on the Irrigated Ag Listserv uh, where we put a lot of different, um, you know, uh, faculty and our faculty so that if people didn't have a relationship with uh, someone, uh, you know, that me, uh, maybe they felt comfortable going to someone else that they did have a relationship with, right? So building upon that. With that in mind, again, if your um, clientele that you're working with operate in a different fashion, we're all in for trying to make this a, a more easily accessible kind of message. So feel free just to uh, shoot me an email and, and share your ideas to, because again, at the end of the day, we're, we're not being very rigid. We're just trying to Get the word out there so that people know about it and um, hopefully be able to, to answer their you know connect them with uh, the best uh, message that we can as far as uh, trying to address their concern yeah and with that thank you faith so much um and gwen um as faith had mentioned her and i are gonna do some work in the background and what i've been kind of calling it is this like resource matchmaking um so i know that specifically within uh, our realm of work, we've heard from a lot of producers that some sort of one-on-one -on -one hotline question answer is really what they're needing. They don't have time to, to look into it and read or um, go through publications. And um, so Faith, is, Faith has worked out a way when she, when she goes through her list of, of questions and how they're being categorized, she's gonna, she's gonna come to me to kind of route some different questions that might be specific to small farms or farmers markets or direct marketing or um, whatever it might be. Um, so we're gonna try to work through our different networks um, to, to answer these questions. I think another thing that is worth mentioning really quick, Faith, is to how we said at first, yeah, we're gonna try to keep that one-on-one -on -one contact via email. But there's also um, the aspect of each of these questions is being posted on your Q&A website with then the response. And I think it's really valuable to, to make sure we say again that we're working really hard to make sure that both the question and the responses are going to be bilingual or shared in two languages. So, um, yep. so yeah, I'm really excited about this and um, we're right there with you, WordPress. <laughs> WordPress website people, we got to stick together, okay? <laughs> yeah, but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, we're just trying to, to get the, the information out there and definitely trying to, because I think that's kind of the beauty of Extension, right? We do have that personal connection to the clients we serve, um, but also just trying to get greater information out there because there's a whole group of people who never interact with us and hopefully we can start engaging with them in a, a more effective way. Um, so. Yeah, thanks for, for giving me time. And as always, like this is not a complex machine. <laughs> it is it's as with most things with extension, it's that people coming together that really care about stuff. So feel free just to email me if you have any ideas. Thank you so much, Faith. I wanted to also just put a plug in for several of the um, youth and families, family consumer faculty, or I think it's family consumer faculty, who have also worked on developing several podcasts and really short videos. And several of those are also offered in Spanish and they're working on getting um, the ones that aren't translated. So I know that's something that came up on our calls over the last couple of weeks is having opportunities to create uh, non-printed material that would also be available in Spanish. And we also had uh, someone reach out to us and ask if the survey could be translated into Spanish as well, the needs assessment survey. So that's something that we're gonna look into um, to make sure that we have um, um, that in Spanish as well. So I don't know if there's anyone on the call. I know it was Margaret Vibrock and Zena Edwards, and there was um, several other faculty working on some of these other family consumer resources that recently came out. Is there anyone here who wants to share any information about that as well?
I will just say that I have um, some follow up, some follow up emails going out to several SNAP um, SNAP uh, organizers throughout the state, and I was hoping to do um, kind of a, a deeper check in um, with them on our next week's meeting, actually. And I just see a question in the chat uh, from Stephen Bramwell. Is the website launched yet? It is launched. Um, so uh, there is, uh, this website is up and running and I think you can find it through um, the food safety link. I didn't put the actual website up here, but we can put that in the chat box today. I just we added it. Okay, great. And then we also had a question about where the needs assessment tool data lives and that lives on our website. So we publish those weekly reports and we have a weekly report, which is all the data together. And then we break it down by internal WSU responses and external to WSU responses. And then I'm also happy to provide specific county reports. So um, King County and Pierce County has asked for reports uh, specifically for um, their stakeholder groups. And so if you're interested in that as well, just let us know. if we're getting some more questions. Great. Perfect. So, um, and again, keep using that chat box to, to share resources. If you are uh, have expertise specifically in food safety, um, uh, particularly for smaller scale operations, please put your contact information in there as well. So we can use you as part of this network uh, to make sure that we're addressing these questions. And I think the other thing that we were really focused on was looking for those one-on-one -on -one business resources, which we've talked about on these calls as well, particularly through um, Business Impact Northwest and some of the other um, uh, resource providers that have information specifically towards technical support and business support. So again, this is more the food processing, farm and food processing side of things, but hoping to continue to uh, promote uh, those other one-on-one -on -one resources as they um, become available. So the next topic that I wanted to focus a little bit on uh, was specifically about um, where are you telling people to get food from or what farms to use? And there's several different initiatives across the state, many of which started because of COVID. And I just wanted to point out and talk a little bit about these. I know that there's some people on the call today that can also share additional information. Um, we have our old farm finder tool. It's many years old, but we're, we're, we're continuing to update it. And so I just, wanna, I just want to make sure that people know that that's out there. Our, our plan right now with the farm finder tool is to eventually phase it out once we have a Washington food atlas. And so WSU um, has been asked to help support the local food promotion program grant that's being submitted by Sustainable Connections, Tilth, and several other organizations. Uh, and they're really working on this incredible effort to put together a food atlas for the entire state. And I know that there's several other regional efforts going on as well, um, but we're just really excited to be able to see this move forward and hoping to make some headway um, even before the grant um, is, we find out whether we got the funding or not. And I really feel that there's a lot of momentum right now, not only within this working group, but among other partners across the state to really move this forward so that not only in COVID, but beyond COVID, we have a really high quality statewide resource um, for people to be able to search for uh, food and farm businesses that they can support. So I just wanted to uh, put a plug in for the farm guide. Um, the, the printed guide, I believe, just came out this past week. If there's anyone from Tilth on the call, if you want to share a little bit about the current farm guide. It also looks like uh, Christine Perry. Do you have a question? Are you raising your hand? Hi, this is uh, Cheryl from Tilt oh, Alliance. I'm hey, on the call. Hi, nice to talk to everybody. Um, so yes, uh, the, the, the farm guide went to the printer this week and also the website is updated and I'm really excited that we have four specific sections in the guide this year for North, uh, Western, Southwestern, Central, and Eastern Washington. And also just so you all know, 
there is a three to four page resource guide within the guide that is a, uh, basically a directory for statewide, regional, and county organizations plus online platforms. So for example, Nicole, uh, under statewide, there's the WSU Food and Farm Finder as a way to say to people who pick up the printed guide, here are all of these other resources in addition to this guide so that we could be as complete as possible. So if anyone has questions they want to ask about the guide, you could put them in the chat or you could also email, email me at TELD. I'll be happy to answer them. And also the online website is open to any farmer or farmer's market that wants to join and there's a free option. Excellent. Here in particular, there was a sliding scale for farms to be able to participate, which I think was just a great um, way to really look at um, access to this access mm -hmm. to being able to participate in this. So I just want to thank Tilt for doing that. We were happy to do it. And if anybody wants to join the website now, there's no charge for them to do that. Great. So that is something that we would love for you all to promote to your networks. Um, this is a great resource that people can use again statewide. So it's not just focused on one part of the state. It's a statewide resource. And um, uh, Cheryl, maybe you can put your email directly in the chat box as well sure so thing. people can find you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I also wanted to put a plug in for Sustainable Connections and the work that they're doing as well. So they have their Eat Local First uh, program and you can see here is just part of their website um, on this slide where you can look for local business listings. They're primarily focused right now in Whatcom and Skagit counties, but in terms of working with TILTH and other organizations to build that statewide platform, they're really leading this effort right now. And um, so it's really exciting to see the work that they're doing. And I don't know if there's anyone on the call from Sustainable Connections that wants to talk a little bit about this particular resource and some of the things that they're really hoping to do in terms of it, its expansion. I see that Marissa's on the call. Hi, this is Marissa from Sustainable Connections. Um, Alex is on the call as well, and he was going to give an update, I believe. Great. Or maybe not. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so um, actually, the screenshot that's being shown is um, our Sustainable Connections website. The Food and Farm Finder, um, the Food Atlas, is actually at eatlocalfirst.org, and it looks um, very different. So the Sustainable well, call, Yeah, I'll pull that up while you're talking. Um, that site is um, about all sectors of business in Whatcom and Skagit counties. Um, so similar to what Tilt said, uh, farms can list for free on the eatlocalfirst.org food atlas. Um, we did have a fee earlier in the year, but we've waived that um, through the end of the year as a way to try and support um, connections for farms in Upper uh, Northwest Washington. And also we've created a COVID availability section, um, trying to connect folks with CSA, uh, farm stands, any farms that are pivoting really quickly. Um, we also have a printed guide, our food and farm finder. Um, we have put the pause on uh, going to print at this point, trying to figure out a distribution plan that's going to be safe. Um, so we are still going to print, but likely going to pivot our campaign a little bit um, and reduce the amount that we're printing and do a bigger digital campaign pointing people to the food atlas. Great, thank you so much. So, I, and this is the website that she was referring to and the link is also, sorry, I grabbed the wrong link there. And the link is also available in our chat box. And then I wanted to also talk a little bit, um, and I see that some people are already sharing. This was kind of the next topic that I wanted to focus in on. And we did get a question in particular too about whether the farms from the Farm Finder tool would go over into the Food Atlas. And that's one of the, on my tasks today is to go through and actually see how many farms we currently have listed on there and 
um, what kind of farms they are to provide that information to the grant team. So um, our goal is to use a lot of the information that's already out there um, to, to help build this database as it gets launched. And that was the next thing I wanted to kind of bring up was local and regional resources. And I see that Stephen already even posted something in the chat box about this. I just grabbed the page from Jefferson County and the local 2020 organization. Um, they are um, continually updating um, information on local farms, farm stands and CSAs, as well as restaurants that are open. Uh, so they've created this resource with a map of food sources as well in Jefferson County. And this is being done in collaboration with several organizations, including um, the WSU Regional Small Farms List or Small Farms um, uh, Group. And so I really wanted to just open this up for a time for those of you who know of local and regional resources to share them either in the chat box or just pipe up and let us know what's happening. I know Diane Dempsey was working uh, through the Clark Conservation District to also put together a list. Sure. Dempster, I'm sorry. Um, and so, yeah, so looking at all of the different resources that we have across the state. Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about the one that you're working on? Um, well, it's kind of on hold until the um, conservation district has a meeting next week. Um, we are talking, um, hoping to combine it with a food finder and I'll make sure we're not duplicating efforts in Clark County, but there is a need for an updated list of farms in Clark County because the latest one is 2017. So, um, you know, uh, we're we're looking to fix that. Um, talking to uh, Christine Perry and um, Zora from uh, so Zora Oppenheimer from uh, Clark Conservation District. Great, so, thank you. And Stephen, oh, go, go ahead. I go ahead. Add to Laura. Yeah. Hi, this is Christine Perry. And um, one of the questions that I have is that, yes, we're really trying to figure out, there are several organizations who are trying to gather um, information about where all of our local farms in in Clark County. And so I guess I'm just wondering, um, we were hoping to look at updating the farm finder, because um, we're finding that it's 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 really outdated so i'm just wondering is that worth us to do that um I, knowing that this um food atlas is going to be coming i guess I'm wondering what the timeline is is it worth us worth it to for us to update the farm finder knowing that maybe that that information will go to the food atlas definitely um, yeah or and and then i'm also just wondering of we're, we're trying to figure out a collaboration with the Water um, Conservation District. And again, is it, would it be better for us to really think about updating what we have, but then really focusing on um, maybe moving that information or knowing that the Food Atlas might be the, the better um, kind of platform that we're gonna wanna use in the future and what maybe the timeline is that on that. Yeah, so the grant itself is due next week and the farm finder tool is going to remain active for probably a few years to come. So we're not going to phase that out anytime soon. It's going to be integrated into um, the food atlas as that goes through different phases of development. So I would encourage everyone to continue to update and use the farm finder tool through WSU. We're gonna to continue to maintain that and hopefully try to strengthen it as well as we move forward and not, um, I, you know, hopefully not duplicate too many efforts, you know, so that we're not getting people to have to enter information into several different platforms as we move forward. So I would encourage you to continue to use the farm finder. I would also encourage you to list through tilt right now as well. Um, with the statewide resource that they have through the farm guide, knowing that listings are free uh, for farmers who want to get up on there. I think that as many different places as they can potentially list is probably really beneficial right now. Um, because people look at different um, resources. So, you know, most people are aware that the farm finder tool through WSU is a, is a bit cumbersome um, and a little bit outdated, but it, it does it does the work you need it to do. You can still query for your county and see if there's any farms yeah. in your county and what kind of services and products they offer. 
Um, so I would, I don't want to uh, discourage anyone from using that because it's not going to go away until this other statewide resource is fully operational. I wanted to also, Jude um, had a great comment in the chat here, and I had this similar thought and have had this similar conversation with a few other folks too about the some details about how farmers can then maintain their own profile on a new platform like a food atlas. So I don't know, Laura, if you guys, I know that we're just the very beginnings of just kind of even grant writing to fund a project like this, but um, do you have any thoughts on that or does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so there'll be an intake form, which is similar to what um, TILF and Sustainable Connections currently use for their Eat Local First and their farm guide. Um, so it'll be kind of a similar type of format. Well, there'll be an intake and then there's some work being done from a research perspective from WSU to look at the kind of um, social capital and language to use to really connect producers and consumers or food and farm businesses and consumers. So. Um, that's going to be actively done throughout the, the project to help kind of guide the information that we would need um, through that intake. And we're hoping not to make it cumbersome. Uh, Misha Ide is on there from uh, Pierce Fresh. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Um, uh, which is a group that's also participating on this. And it's been great to have a producer involved uh, thinking through sort of all of those complexities of the amount of time it would take a producer to do sort of their um, intake form and what that looks like and how they can update it as well. So those are all things that are getting worked out logistically through the project itself. Um, but yeah, there's, that's definitely at the, at the top of um, the team's mind. Yeah, and I can just chime in just really quickly too from um, Sustainable Connections with the Eat Local First Food Atlas. Um, our tool as it stands right now is region specific for Whatcom, Skagit, San Juan and Island counties. Um, so I would say in the immediate future, if a farm is located in our region, um, obviously it would be great for them to list as many places as they can, but we are really aware that um, it's hard to keep many platforms updated. Um, and so I would hope that farms that are in Whatcom County would update their information on the food atlas. And similarly um, in Seattle um, with the Tilth website, because that's the immediate need to reach those audiences um, is really what's important at this particular moment while we're working on all of these other grant um, opportunities. Great, thanks Marissa. And I saw in the chat box a couple other resources that have been developed that I'd love for people to share, particularly regional resources or local ones. I saw, I think it was Thurston Conservation District. Uh, Stephen, are you on the call and want to share about that? And I also saw something from Grace Harbor posted by Chris. Thanks for sharing the links in the chat box though, everyone, just so you know, everything that goes into the chat box also helps inform the resource hub. So we feed all of the, all of the information that comes through there um, onto the website and through our event calendar. So keep it coming, even if you um, can't share your mic or don't want to. <laughs> Yeah, I see the resource that Chris posted was for Grays and Mason, um, Grays Harbor and Mason counties. I'd love to hear about some of the efforts happening as well. I know that Pullman and Whitman County have been working really hard to support uh, local food and farm businesses um, in Eastern Washington. Or, and I know Stevens County, excuse me, had a map or a published guide in the past. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's anyone in central and eastern Washington that want to share specific resources that they know about. Uh, this is Nils. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, the, this, the nonprofit called the Community Ag Development Center, originally developed by Al Koitz, who was extension director at the time, had a farm guide um, that was published on paper and it kind of lost steam and also became 
you know, just wasn't popular anymore. And so it hasn't been published since I think uh, 2016 was the last time it was published. Um, but what my plan is to take all the farms that are still viable that were on that guide, plus any new ones and put them into the farm finder tool so they get migrated into the, the next version of the tool. I hope that's a good plan. Yes, that's an excellent plan. And Nils, I'll follow up with you. I can make you a back end admin so you can manage your own pending farms and things like that as you work through that process. Oh, that would be great. We'll connect. Okay, great. Um, the Spokane Food Policy Council is uh, starting to do a, a needs assessment in different sectors. And uh, one of those, of course, is producers. And maybe that list can be um, borrowed uh, and then used, you know, to put together some uh, information on Spokane County farms that uh, can go into the farm finder. I'll have to work uh, towards that. And I'm also planning to add all of Stevens County farmers, including the ones that are like tractor ag farmers, we call them, um, to that guide that the Spokane Food Policy Council is, or not guide to that list that the Spokane Food Policy Council is gonna have. Great. Um, I see that Jill from Snow Valley TILF also posted the farm directory that they have for Snow Valley TILF. Jill, do you wanna talk a little bit about the scope of that guide and if it covers just Snohomish County or if it covers a larger region? Yeah, um, this is Jill with Snow Valley TILF. I, um, our guide actually is just um, a guide that we put out for our farm members. So it covers through the Snoqualmie and Snohomish Valleys. Um, predominantly, we do have a few members that are outside of that scope. Um, but we've updated that very recently. We've touched base with each of our farmers and um, a lot of them have change their business models. So we've included that information. Great, thank you so much. And I see that Hannah Browse also uh, put up here Gorge Grown. And so, and that covers both sides of the river down in the gorge, right, Hannah? Oregon and Washington? Yes, it does. So it's Oregon and Washington. And then if you check out, it's what we, we call it, uh, Who's Your Farmer? And um, it's, it's also like you can search by keywords and then you can also break it down by like under meat. There's 32 people who are producing meat, but for example, 11 of them are beef, one of them's bison, 20 of them do eggs, two of them do fish. So like, and so on and so forth. But there's other things too, like around agritourism, around um, Christmas trees, who's also doing baked goods or value added like um, cheese and fiber. And then there's also a section where it breaks it down by purchasing options. How many of these people have CSAs? Who delivers? Who's at the farmer's markets? Who has a farm stand? Um, online orders, restaurants, specialty markets, and wholesale. So that's um, a, a tool that we are, are hoping is valuable, you know, to, to the general public who are looking to source local produce, but also, uh, you know, people in uh, food industry who are looking uh, as well. Great, thank you. It's great to see all these links being shared because we can definitely uh, create like a regional list um, of all of the directories that are currently available on our website. So I see also that Clallam, Jefferson and Kitsap, they have a regional small farms directory, uh, which is up on their website. Um, and then we also have uh, Stephen um, has posted a couple things. Stephen, I see you. Do you want to say anything about any of the resources that are currently available in Thurston County in the South Sound? Yeah, sorry, earlier I, I was had a, a microphone snafu. Um, you know, the one that's ongoing that's been kind of the longest running is that South of the Sound Community Farmland Trust Guide. Um, so it covers a few counties um, and they have a print edition. So that's coming off the press here pretty quickly. It's the South Sound Community Farmland Trust um, farm map. Um, there's other resources in there as well is, that, that are nice. Um, and, uh, and then and they, what's also nice, they have a farm listing and then there's also a CSA listing. So they just do a really nice job and they've kind of had a long um, history of, of, of that work. And then there's this additional resource now that the Thurston Conservation District put out, the farmer's basket. So that's kind of complimentary. Great, thank you so much. And I just got a,
question in the chat from Maggie Great, and I was going to look up the map that the WSDA has posted. I'll put the link up here too that has all 500 food distribution sites in the state listed. So um, if anyone else wants to share for a minute why I pull that up, uh, that would be great. And then I can put the link in there as well for everyone. I have something to share just here quickly. It's somewhat unrelated to the last topic, but I don't know if you can see, I've got a, I'm in my vehicle loaded full of food boxes, but um, uh, just the last few days, my time has been um, used up trying to take advantage of some of the potatoes and hopefully maybe onions that are being dumped now because uh, processors in the Tri-Cities area are no longer accepting potatoes because the world market for French fries has crashed. And so I went down uh, two days ago, I think it was, day before yesterday, I can't remember. Anyway, um, down to Ritzville and picked up 1,600 pounds of potatoes for our food pantries in our area. Um, it's half my job um, working with in food access. But I just thought I should mention that to anybody else who's working on food access, that there's a huge amount of waste going on right now because the big ag industry has their markets crashing. Thanks, Nils. And that would be a great topic for next week as well. I know there's been a lot of information coming out in general about um, big ag food waste, as well as the challenges uh, in terms of uh, processing animals. Uh, we had a call this week with our WSU steering committee talking about that specifically. So um, that would be a great focus for next week to really uh, dive deep into some of those challenges and look at uh, both resources and some solutions. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I did just put a, a link in here uh, for the map that's being produced by the WSDA. And um, it has all of the food distribution, distribution sites listed in the state. Um, and if you click on a site, you can see um, what it's called, uh, where it's located, who the main point of contact is as well. Um, so this is throughout the entire state and then at the top of the page you'll see that they've also posted links to the WSDA food assistance program, the Northwest Harvest Food Bank map, the Food Lifeline Food Bank map, and Second Harvest map. So you can go directly to any of those organizations as well uh, to find that information. Uh, so it's a very uh, it's a great resource to be able to share, whether it's on your website or send it out to anyone in your community, um, especially with all the increase in SNAP enrollments and other people who are looking for access to food right now. Um, it, you know, we're, we're expecting a twofold increase in users at all of these uh, food security sites over the next month. And so, um, again, I encourage you to use this resource uh, with your communities. Laura, this is Hannah Brous. I had a kind of a, oh, I guess, I guess you could call it amusing, but uh, as, as Niels was sharing, you know, I was thinking about if we're going to talk next week a little bit more about, uh, breaks in the food chain, but also for a lot of us working in food security, where some of those opportunities might be right now. I know some of those things are like immediate, right? Where it's like, it's, it's um, this opportunity to pick up, you know, it's happening now. I kind of see that as like gleaning on a major, on a major scale in a way. Um, I wonder if there's a, if there's some kind of a platform or a way for us to be able to disseminate that information, because I know it's, it's really timely, you know? So if Niels did that, two or three days ago that they may not still have uh, opportunity for people to pick up, but somebody else might. I wonder, has anybody seen anything like that across the state where um, there's an opportunity on a large scale where like even from my region, maybe we could send up our, you know, our mobile farmers market to go pick, pick up um, items like that. 
I think it would be great next week. If, and I don't know if anyone from Food Lifeline Second Harvest or Northwest Harvest is on the call right now, um, but it would be really great to hear if they have capacity in sort of the work that they're doing right now to help with some of that, um, because it does take uh, transportation, storage, like Mills was saying, uh, it's pretty um, challenging. And so I don't know if there's anyone on the call in particular from either of those organizations, but we can always ask next week um, if they can. I know Laura Titzer is on as well as Jen Moss. Um, Laura, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in terms of trying to uh, pick up some of that food surplus. Um, yeah, this is Laura. I can I can speak a little bit to it, um, though it's a, a little about a little bit out of my area of focus here at Northwest Harvest. But um, we, our procurement team, is getting calls constantly from growers um, to be able to pick up food um, and things like that, and we're not able to really keep up with that at this point. Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that for those of you that don't know, um, Second Harvest and Food Lifeline and Northwest Harvest worked with the state um, to do um, a statewide effort for these variety boxes that we're calling them, which is shelf stable variety boxes um, to the emergency food system network across the state. Um, and with that, we split the state up. So even though Northwest Harvest, for instance, is a statewide agency, we're now primarily focused in 13 counties. Um, and then the other two agencies, the distributors, are focused on two other sections of the state to make sure everyone's covered. Um, and then um, from that, um, uh, I'd say like with that, that's been our primary focus. And then we're also seeing this huge uptick of produce, but not a lot of avenues to be able to get rid of it um, and to be able to get it out into the system because of all of the different ways the food banks have to distribute food now um, um, to you know, comply with the social distancing and things like that. And so there's just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of barriers and difficulties in getting produce out on the food bank level that we're seeing um, and and just that capacity for storage at the food bank level. So there's a lot of different um, kind of ping points within the system that we're trying to work out. Um, we're having conversations with um, Harvest Against Hunger, formerly Rotary First Harvest, and having conversations around different ways that we could set up um, uh, with the emergency food system to increase capacity, um, cold storage capacity. So I guess a long way of saying there's a lot of conversations happening to figure out how we can be um, helping with this. And um, But right now it's been really difficult for us to take on a lot more produce. Thank you, Laura. Um, I know I've had some conversations too with OSU and University of Idaho and the University of Washington um, were looking at developing a project and how restaurants fit into all of that as well in terms of storage space and opportunity for processing, um, given the fact that they've seen such reduced um, activity. And so, you know, maybe this is something we can brainstorm a little bit more for next week's conversation and invite um, some of um, the um, key stakeholders across the state working on this. Um, and I also see that we have some information like Cheryl Weiser even mentioned like maybe smaller regional uh, food banks like Family Works in Seattle, um, seeing what they're doing. I see Nils, did you just raise your hand? Um, no? Okay, so thinking about um, specifically about some of the things that we could do and. Chris also just mentioned, could we speak um, to any coordination regionally on the USDA Farmers to Families Food Box Program, what's coming online in a few weeks on the hunger relief or food bank side? So um, Chris, I'd love to open up that conversation as well. Are you meaning next week or um, did you want to bring- Laura, Does he mean Laura Titzer? Oh, he might be, yeah. There's so many Lauras on the call. Yeah, Laura Titzer. Great. <laughs> Too many Lauras, yeah, Laura Titzer. <laughs> Too many Lauras, okay, great. Yeah. Laura yeah, I can I can speak to that a little bit, Chris, and that's another piece. So we have been um, for that um, CFAP grant, I our procurement team was, um, I just learned 
earlier this week got pretty barraged with a lot of phone calls um, from different growers to participate as partners on their grants. Um, and we have um, worked with, um, we are working with Link Foods um, and their cooperative over in um, Spokane on their grant. Um, but once again, getting back to that capacity, we were really nervous about agreeing to be on a lot of folks' grant applications um, without really knowing um, that that produce can get all the way to the end user um, without um, uh, you know, getting wasted in the process of if there's a lack of storage capacity and things like that. So we were really hesitant on um, doing too much um, until we can get more pieces figured out on the ground with the food banks to make sure we don't overwhelm the system. And then we end up doing exactly what we don't want to do of produce going to waste. Um, so that's kind of that piece. And I'll say on the other side, we are though also um, before um, kind of this grant came on board, we were internally also looking at piloting um, a program to uh, purchase um, basically like CSA boxes. It's pretty much the same as this grant. And we were, and so we were thinking about doing that before the grant and that's something we're still working on. We've actually secured some state funding to do some produce boxes that um, we are um, going to be um, working with some growers that I don't know, I'm not sure who those growers are going to be yet on um, Western Washington and then um, uh, and some growers in Central Washington and that's a pilot that we're doing there and we really just wanted to start smaller to, to see how it goes and then potentially grow it out and expand it as we can get that capacity in place. Great, thank you so much, Laura. Chris, do you have anything you wanna share in particular as well in regards to Farm to School and some of the work that you're doing? Um, sure, thanks, Laura, for to that update on the Food Box program. We, I've been working this week a lot on uh, folks that are um, trying to apply for that, so I might reach out to you directly and on that pilot too, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Um, I don't, I don't think any major updates, uh, from farm to school, although, um, we're going to start working on, uh, I guess I'm calling it a live farm to school availability list. And so even the discussion earlier of all the directories that are already out there, um, trying to provide some good information based on a lot of that data that's out there already to schools on what, um, local products, especially as the season's getting started, um, or things that are really good for school meals and the way that they're distributing them now. Um, that's a project that we'll be working on and trying to um, get that information out to schools, collected from farms and out to schools um, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but just to make clear, it's not gonna be a duplicative, I think, of those efforts. It's actually gonna depend on a lot of the directories that everyone's already using um, and then asking anybody to any farms or individual uh, listings to um, update things if they're specifically trying to reach schools and have products that are uh, a great fit for what schools are doing now uh, to see, you know, pack and distribute food. Great, thanks, Chris. And I know I haven't had a chance to go through last week's data um, yet from our needs assessment tool uh, in, in detail, but one of the high needs that was um, uh, selected or high need, uh, need that was selected several times as high need was support for school garden coordinators. And so I'm just wondering if you can share a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing uh, specifically related to that as well. Um, yeah, I guess it depends on what kind of support they're looking for. I mean, I think district by district, every school district is handling um, access to school gardens, maintenance, watering. It's a decision that's made at the district level. So uh, it varies district to district on what those decisions are um, and what kind of, you know, if there's remote video education or something that can be done um, from the garden, some schools and organizations are taking that on as well um, and yeah within kind of the OSPI guidance um, schools and districts are um, figuring out how to continue um, keeping gardens 
kept up and, and maintained um, if they're able to, to get access to them. Does that help? I don't know if that was. Yeah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, for. but um, I think, you know, once I dig into that a little bit deeper, I'll know a little bit more, but that it just was interesting that that came up as a higher need than we'd seen in the past, so. Yeah, so folks in the um, Washington State Farm to School Network, a few local school garden organizations and leads and, and with OSPI have been um, working on a few issues related to school gardens. So um, that'd be a great place to send folks into the Washington State Farm to School Network um, to get looped in on that. On it, Chris. Thank you. On it. Um, and then I also see that Jen posted some information about SNAP-Ed. Jen, do you want to share that in particular and kind of the what's happening across the SNAP-Ed landscape right now in Washington? Sure. So we are doing the best we can, <laughs> as everyone is, to adjust to this new way of delivering our programming. Um, as I said in the chat box, we have not received any waiver yet that was, says that we can work more closely with food distribution, so we can't be on site in any places, which makes it a little more challenging in terms of helping with some of the supply chain stuff, but we can serve um, as a conduit between places. So if there's, if there's places we can plug in there, we're happy to. Um, we're working on some guidelines for um, how to post to social media and different platforms in a way that is compliant with our SNAP-Ed guidance. We're working on how to be compliant with snap ed guidance around virtual education as well. So we're just continuing to adjust to the to the landscape as best we can and plug in where we can. But as always, we're super interested in helping make those connections if at all possible. So if you are in a county where you need some connections to food banks or or snap ed folks, uh, reach out to your snap ed coordinator because I'm sure people are very interested in, in connecting. Great, thank you, Jen. So we kind of already uh, moved into this like last portion of our call where it's just really open um, to other topics that we want to discuss as well as uh, just sharing stories. So I just want to encourage anyone who has a resource that they want to share that we haven't talked about today or something new um, that has developed over the last week uh, to please do so. You can put it in the chat box or you can just uh, share with all the folks on the call. Um, and we'd also just like to hear how you're doing. So if you have an interesting story, something that you've um, been challenged with over the last week or a success that you had, uh, go ahead and share as well. Hey, Laura, this is Clea. Um, you had mentioned that um, at the last steering committee um, meeting, you were talking a little bit about kind of meat supply disruptions, if I understood correctly. I'd love to hear if anyone has any updates on if there are any opportunities opening up um, given some of the shutdowns that have happened in our state of the um, large uh, meat processing facilities. If there's openings right now that we could pursue in terms of policy changes, um, you know, in light of COVID that we could take advantage of for our, our small scale producers. Yeah, so we just had a very preliminary conversation about it, but I know a couple of the examples that we did bring up and Nils is on the call was about looking at exemptions through county health departments to be able to do um, some custom slaughter of animals that normally would uh, ha have had to go to a USDA inspection plant. Nils was worked on that for his pork to food pantry program. I think I got that right. Um, and so that was something that we kind of were thinking about looking into. It was interesting on our all extension call on Wednesday because at that question came up, uh, do people still have capacity, especially with all the 4-H and FFA animals that were raised specifically for auction and slaughter this year, whether people had access. And it was interesting to see that um, at least in some of the areas in Eastern Washington, people still felt like they had um, adequate access to slaughter. Um, but we didn't hear from anyone in particular in Western Washington. So uh, it would be great to hear if there are, you know, specific examples of challenges where people are not able to get in to a facility to have animals um, 
harvested or if they're not able to book with custom, uh, just so we have some more information to go on. Uh, and, I, and I do think that there is, a, like you said, Clea, a great opportunity right now to see if there are some um, ways that maybe the WSDA um, can be resourced to be able to do some of that inspection work in lieu of the lack of USDA access. Um, I don't know if Flora Raymond's on the call or anyone else associated with the WSDA. I know that there was also a bill that was submitted um, by Representative Erickson, I believe, from Whatcom County, and I don't know where that is in process right now and whether that was something that they were looking at, but I think it was to fund WSDA to do USDA uh, level inspection. Um, and then I'm part of the Food Systems Leadership Network listserv, and there's been a tremendous activity in the last week on looking at relaxing state regulations and federal regulations to allow uh, even restaurants to be able to um, uh, help with some of the custom slaughter and um, processing um, that could take place. So I, there's kind of two different things. We have like the access to USDA for retail, but also we're seeing a massive increase in people wanting to buy animals custom. And so whether or not there's gonna be enough capacity over time to uh, harvest all of those animals. And then also the loss of all of the livestock auctions this year. So people don't have an opportunity necessarily to sell the animals that they were raising. Um, yeah, so I it would be great to, to open that up for some discussion yeah, because I feel like, again, um, uh, there's this opens up an opportunity for our um, legislatures to see the, the problems that exist during normal times in, uh, you know, in these supply chains and whether or not we can have a mechanism to really highlight the changes that that need to be made in the short term that could lead to positive restructuring in the long term. I'd love to uh, be a part if there's if there's those conversations going on right now, or if there's an organized effort, somehow that we could um, begin to start those conversations and put out some, um, you know, PR materials, I, I'd love to be a part of that. Great. Thanks, Clea. I know um, Nils just posted in the chat box. So he was able to get a variance for meat processing by in Stevens County. Um, so that custom slaughter uh, port could go directly into the food pantry system. Is that correct, Nils? That was the, the way that that worked out. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, this was something that as a food systems program steering committee sort of rose to the top of our conversation on Tuesday. And I know Hannah and Nicole, Hannah and Nicole were also going to reach out to some of the other people within the WSU network. So maybe we can work on getting a, a working group together to look at this specifically. And we'd love to have you on board, um, Clea, and anyone else too on the call who is really interested in this um, and would like to you know, just share your information in the chat box or let us know um, that you're interested in, in working through this. I know Nicole's been also in the process of trying to figure out what to do with a farm walk that we had on humanely raised animals, humanely raised and slaughtered animals, and um, whether or not there may be some opportunity uh, to use the funding that we had for that particular farm walk to maybe even highlight some of the alternatives or ways that we can be more innovative uh, around um, livestock right now, so. Yeah, I've had, so we've been working on something with Alyssa Umars over at the Metau Conservancy um, for a little bit now. They were able over in Okanagan and Tenasket to get a new USDA um, slaughter facility up and running at Double S Meats. Um, and so we had a farm walk. We were going to go to a beef producer and then to the processing facility there. We're not going to do that. So now we are trying to creatively parlay the same resources, the same funds. Um, to get the similar similar educational experience virtually online. Um, which you can't do, but we're going to try and do it. 
But I would say in general, CLIA and anyone else who's interested, we're um, trying to use a portion of those funds and also through any other efforts of, of grant writing or raising funds, trying really to use our WA Meetup um, brand and the efforts that have been started there to, be, to give space to small and niche meat producers um, so that they have a, a way to connect and network with one another. And then we have a way to uh, provide resources and um, experiences. So we're hoping to, to use that as well to get more information out there for consumers about how to access um, locally raised meats um, in their areas and how to get to know the farms in their areas and vice versa. So yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, I would say I want one thing I wanted to add to the livestock conversation that I think everyone just needs to hear is that we even have soil scientists right, right now that are looking a more deeply into animal composting because the reality is that uh, depending on the scale of the producer, people are now in some scaled or uh, some areas of the ag agricultural sectors having to depopulate. And I think everyone needs to understand what that means and needs to understand um, uh, how all the different scaling of things is really, really coming to light now. But um, yeah, so it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Oh, um, can I add one comment, Nicole and Laura? Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's, it's one of the things that is a disadvantage of this WSU group is that we're not allowed to lobby. And there needs to be legislation change. Uh, and I think the quickest way to get the legislation change is probably through the State Department of Health and then work with the WSDA for something more long term. So it's absolutely critical that we have agencies involved, uh, NGOs or others that can can actually lobby on behalf of this issue, because there's basically nothing I can do or you can do about it um, directly. Yeah, and just if anybody doesn't realize that as as state employees, we we are we cannot advocate in any way. Um, but we did get a nice reach out this week from Chris Mulek, who is in the Office of um, External Affairs and Government Relations, and they he is one of our lobbyists for WSU, and so they are able to talk about these things on our behalf. So sure. I think that that is one way of being able, you know, as a subgroup, we could we could uh, schedule some time to meet next week and just kind of start thinking about some of those um, challenges and innovations and being able to then pass that on to external affairs and government relations and have them do some of that work on our behalf, um, I think would be really important. And I think right now, like they're thinking about that right now themselves. I mean, it was something that he brought up several times just in communication with us last week or this week. Um, about other things, but kept bringing up WAM Meetup and that work and that community and how to support them. So, you know, it's it's definitely at the top of their minds as well. And so I think, um, you know, like um, Clay was saying, strike while the iron's hot. And, you know, there's a lot going on right now uh, that's going to affect the sector. I mean, all of our food system sectors are being really impacted right now, but um, I feel like you know, this is, there needs to be some sort of urgent communication. And so I'm happy to help schedule a call next week um, uh, with the group. It looks like we should probably have Gary Fredericks involved. I don't know if he's still on the line. Um, and Nils, it would be great to have you involved if you have time. Hannah, Clea, um, and then anyone else who wants to join in, just go ahead and put your name in that chat box and we will reach out to you and uh, get a group of people together so we can talk about this and you don't have to be internal to WSU. Um, it'd be great to hear from those who are working across this sector outside of WSU as well because you have a, a different level of liberty than we do in terms of some of the communication. Oh and uh, Pat said Paul Cooper as well. Yep. Great. Oh, and Chris just volunteered Laura Raymond. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, excellent. Anything else in particular that uh, people want to bring up today to talk about? Yeah, Mark, that's a great uh, suggestion. Also, Pat, I know Mark has been working with 4-H and FFA -F 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 to figure out what to do with all the kids. Um, 
that have been raising livestock as well. Yeah, those both two guys need to be included. Um, Mark has been involved in the meat stuff, you know, at this level for a long, long time. So yeah, I would definitely make sure those guys get included. Great. I have a running list of about 42 WSU ag specific people um, that we developed. So I can, I can, we can go deep and really just put the call out to see who's working on stuff and if they would want, want to get in on a call. Let's zoom it. <sighs> zoom party. Any awesome. other topics today that people want to bring up, stories to share? Uh, yeah, this is Kate. I was on a uh, call with a bunch of uh, King County farmers last evening. Yep. And there were a couple of related um, topics that came up that... Um, one, I would like to hope that this group can, can either address directly or point me in the right direction. And it basically involves consumer education at the most base level regarding food production and, the, and the, just the way that food moves through the system that we currently have and the example that was given. And I would also suggest this person um, for your meat group, uh, Leah Cranick of Cranick Dairy. Um, who has been fielding way too many calls in the recent weeks from folks that want to come out to her dairy, and, and they fell into, I believe, Darabal. Uh They want to come out there, and can we buy some cheese and, and, and cream from you? And people that are just, like, completely dumbfounded and, and clueless, as to the fact that, well, no, even if I had it, I couldn't sell it to you because we, you know, et cetera and so forth. And so her plea was, is there some sort of like a cartoon or a short movie or some sort of pamphlet or something that just describes in the most basic terms the current food system that we have so that if you want to depart from it, i.e. going to the grocery store and connect with a local farmer, it doesn't work the same way. Um, and I, so I put that out to the group and I guess then the other part of it is that I don't think that the majority of consumers out there even know to ask that question, i.e., oh, could I buy things from a local farm, let alone have the, the subsequent thought, oh, well, maybe I should do a Google search for a farm finder uh, to locate that farm. And so I think having some sort of huge PSA or some sort of in-your-face-to-the-consumer uh, publicity regarding eat local first, et cetera, and so forth, uh, that then can drive folks to, oh, okay, I never even had that thought before. Now I realize I can. Then certainly your food finders and all these other things totally fit and become highly useful at that point. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Kate. And um, I don't know if you'd be willing to work with us on something like that. I mean, I, I think all just even the resources we got today in the chat box, we got so many resources for specific ways to find farms across the state, as well as knowing that tilt um, can list and um, Eat Local First Sustainable Connections also put information in the chat box to be able to submit information. You know, if we had some sort of public service announcement, maybe even something that we could even have go out on NPR, being a public institution, that's something that I know is possible um, to really drive consumers towards some of these resources so that they're not uh, just trying to find farms and call them up uh, without those farms actually wanting to be contacted, so. Right, right, yeah. I mean, I was just blown away that people are, that, yeah, that that level of, of unfortunate ignorance exists. Um, and also, too, I had very recently a conversation with uh, one of the local uh, AM radio stations uh, in Snohomish County 
wondering what they could do and obviously looking for a sponsor behind it to also help promote local farms and stuff. And like NPR and whatnot, as a general rule, these folks rarely do much of anything for free. Um, to a limited extent, they can. But as a general rule, when you get a blanket rollout on something, there's some sort of funding behind it, a sponsor of some sort, um, which when I see some of the generosity that is occurring uh, right now in regards to the crisis, I feel more hopeful than I normally would that it would be possible to get funding uh, where necessary and guineas from uh, radio stations and maybe TV, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, if if we're able to just give them a, a, a short, sweet package of, hey, this is the problem, here's the solution, call us. Yeah, that's great. And I know we were, um, we invited Rebecca, I can't remember her last name right now, who works with an extension as um, a publicist um, to be part of this call today. And that might be something that we can do specifically with her as well. She was looking at um, trying to develop um, some specific outreach materials for the work that we're doing. And um, one of the things that we'd also talked about was putting together a press release and maybe that would be something, not necessarily with her directly, but just putting together some uh, press release, which we could do internally within WSU, but then send out to all of these networks. and. We've also worked with Tom Bonzi in the past um, on our Cascadia Grains work, and I know he's also interviewed Stephen Bramwell, and maybe it would be worth even reaching out to him. He's one of the contributors on NPR um, to see if this is a story he'd be interested in running. So using some of the social capital that we've already built uh, within our work and our the realms in which we work. So if there's other people that have um, some, uh, some co connection through with press, uh, different types of media, that would be great um, uh, as we look at putting something together. I think it's a great idea, Kate. Well, I'm happy to help in whatever way I can. Great. Thank you. We're nearing about an hour and a half for the call. I know that's probably everyone's kind of max time on Zoom. Um, but if there's anyone else who'd like to share, uh, we can definitely spend a few more moments on the call. And I know, Nicole, um, was there anything in particular that you wanted to bring up towards the end? Or I know we had talked a little bit about like anyone who's doing some virtual event planning, if you wanna stay on for an extra few minutes, you can, but we can also follow up with that next week. Sure, sure. Um, I think, um... I think if, if there's not anyone, anyone else that wants to share a fun or joyful story um, or something like that, um, something that did come up this week in some other calls was um, event um, people who, come here then. Don't just stand outside my door and bark. That's my three-year-old, everyone, thank you. Um, he, so having um, having an opportunity for anyone who's now having to pivot their event platform for any given event that they may be um, used to be responsible for or is still responsible for that we could just open up the end of these calls for a little bit of um, networking or problem solving. So that was it. I don't know if Abba is still on the line, if she would want to put in, put any specific plea out there. Okay, so um, I think that I think that that about covers it. It looks like there there was a a large amount of directories um, that we talked through today, um, all of which will get routed to the hub. Um, if you want to reach out to me through an email for any kind of meat related or livestock related. Um, work, feel free to reach out to me in email. Something I also have an email queued up is for any of you cultivating success or small ag or ag or food systems coordinators out there in the WSU extension world, 
Um, I'm following up with some of you about Farm Finder updating, but if there are any else, anybody else out there that would be interested in as being an, added as an admin in the back end of the Farm Finder, follow up with me. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, just a reminder again to do the needs assessment tool. And then we talked a little bit about uh, some of the areas that we could focus on for discussion next week. So in particular, um, meat and what's happening across the livestock industry. Um, my brain is, is going now. We talked about a few other areas that we'd want to, oh, looking specifically at distribution and uh, a uh, large scale food surplus and how to pivot into um, a, yeah, a, food waste and food access. I exactly. Think. So um, we'll look into some of these topics in more detail for our hub meeting next week. Uh, we'll work on getting together a subcommittee to work specifically on meat related issues and then also work on some sort of PR plan to really do some outreach specifically to consumers about access to um, locally produced goods. So um, sounds good. And I really, uh, I really want to thank everyone for participating today. Um, we really enjoy being able to see all of you, hear stories, hear what you're up to. So again, thank you again uh, for being here. And this recording will be uh, posted to our hub sometime this afternoon. So if you know of someone who you would like to uh, watch this, if there is information there that you think that they would have gotten a benefit out of, please go ahead and forward that link on and be well, take care. And I, someone said today we're uh, heading into our third March in a row since we've all been home since March. So the months just kind of blur together. So I, I um, wanna just thank all of you for being engaged and for all the hard work you're doing to help support food and farm businesses. Bye everybody.